us start our lecture tonight. We will begin to talk today about something intriguing, which despite being cosmic, is nevertheless related in some way to the intimate self-realization of the being. I want to refer, in an emphatic manner, to the moon. It is convenient that we know the influences of the moon and the relationship of this satellite with ourselves and with the planet Earth in general. The Origin of the Moon there are two contradictory theories regarding our lunar satellite. One emphatically asserts that the moon is a piece of the planet Earth ejected into space. There are several pseudo-esoteric and pseudo-occult authors who advocate that theory. It is said that a few million years ago, when the comet Condor collided with our planet Earth, two fragments of our planet were projected into space. Behold the two moons, because although it is true that people believe that we have one moon, in reality we have two moons. The other is so small that it is really only perceived through the telescope like a grain of lentil, because it is only a few kilometers in size. It is quite far from our planet Earth. It is called Lilith and it revolves around our planet, it is the black moon. But we are not going to deal with Lilith now. It is necessary that we occupy ourselves with this satellite that illuminates us at night, because it is closely related to the psychological part of each one of us. In the name of the truth we have to say that this, our satellite, is older than our planet Earth, and this has now been demonstrated with carbon-14 tests. The stones brought back by the astronauts have been carefully examined, and it definitely clarified that thesis. The Eastern world emphatically affirms that the moon is the mother of the Earth. Thus, there are two positions about this satellite. We have to unravel, then, its mystery. Is the moon a piece of the planet Earth projected into space? This is what many pseudo-esotericists say, and even famous esotericists. Is it older than the planet Earth? This is what the Eastern world affirms. Which of the two theses will be exact? The facts will speak. A certain author, whose name I do not mention, because in truth, we should not in any way criticize anyone, dared to say that it is a new planet, that it is being born, that it is in the process of formation, and that it vampirizes or sucks the Earth's vitality, thus, it lives off the Earth. But the Eastern world says that the Earth is the one that vampirizes the moon. Who is right? Let's go to the facts. The astronauts have been on the moon. You know this, nobody denies this. Photographs have been taken there, and there is nothing to show that the moon is vampirizing the Earth. If the moon were vampirizing the Earth, there would be life on the moon already, and it turns out that it looks like a billiard ball, extinct volcanoes, seas without water, sands and more sands, pebbles and more pebbles, huge rocks, and no plant or animal life. So the facts are showing that the moon is not vampirizing the earth. On the other hand, the earth is vampirizing the moon, although it no longer has to vampirize it. The earth has rich mineral, plant, animal, and human life, that is, the life of the moon was absorbed by the earth. These are the facts, and I refer to the facts. If the moon were vampirizing the earth, then the moon would have life, yet instead it is very dead. The eastern world says that the moon is the mother of the earth. I agree with that concept. But how could we really know something about the moon, something other than the mere repetition of what the Easterners say and what the Westerners say? This could be possible only with the Oluestesnoknian type of vision, yes, only with that kind of vision, nothing more. I repeat, by means of the Oluestesnoknian type of vision. The death of the moon. Let us spell it well, write it down, the vision O, L, O, O. 2 O S E S T E S N O T K H N A N, correct. That type of vision is the only sense that can allow us to investigate something about the moon. But what kind of vision is this? What kind of vision is that which is called Oluestis Nocnian? 
This is a type of vision that does not belong to the lower psychism. It is the type of vision of the one who knows the light of the light, of the one who knows the flame of the flame, the intelligence of the intelligence, the truth of the truth, the hidden of the hidden. Could one who has not yet disintegrated the psychic aggregates within oneself possess this type of vision? Obviously not. Only with such a degree of vision would it be possible to know something true about the moon. In the name of truth, I must tell you that I, as an initiate or bodhisattva, had to work in past Mahaman Vantaras, and I really knew the ancient Earth Moon. That satellite was a planet like our planet, it had rich mineral, plant, animal, and human life, stormy seas and erupting volcanoes, etc. All the satellites of our solar system were part of the past solar system, which in esotericism is called the lunar chain. So any solar system is born, grows, ages and dies. This is how the lunar chain was, including the moon that illuminates us at night, which was a planet of the various planets of the lunar chain. Times of activity are called in esotericism Mahaman Vantaras, times of inactivity, the cosmic nights, are called prolayas. Thus, the moon had life and is the mother of the earth, this must be understood. When the cosmic night arrived, the lunar life overturned in the higher dimensions of nature and the cosmos, and the geological crust was abandoned, that is, the seas little by little were depleting, evaporating, and the volcanoes exhausted their fires, after the seventh great root race. The moon had seven great root races, but at the end of the seventh great root race, the entire lunar life turned into the fourth dimension, much later into the fifth, later into the sixth, and finally in the seventh dimension, the physical cortex was properly abandoned, turned into a corpse. That entire past solar system, whose only exponents today are the lunar satellites of our current solar system, physically died, but continued to exist from the point of view of what is called substance, that is, in the last synthesis it was turned into something that we could say promatter, into something that is called iliaster. This is something that lets us think, Iliaster. What is Iliaster? We would say, the protile of our physical matter, however, this term, very modern, does not satisfy us either, it is substance, it is the Mula Prakriti of the Asians, and so on. It seems impossible, but our solar system, in the last synthesis, could be reduced to a seed, to its Iliaster, and that's it. Let's take a tree. A tree has evolved from a germ, and in the germ are potentially the trunk, the branches, and the leaves, and the flowers, and the fruits, the iliaster is the seed of any solar system. Thus, the moon chain was reduced to its iliaster, and the iliaster, matter remained in power, it remained latent. I have to say, in the name of the truth, that by means of this type of vision already cited, which is of a profoundly endoteric nature, it has been possible, then, to investigate the planets and their iliaster, they are beyond time, fourth dimension, also beyond eternity, fifth dimension, they are deposited in deep space. O Luestus Nocnian, behold the kind of vision that has allowed us to investigate in the Mula Prakriti, planets deposited within the deep bosom of the unmanifestation, awaiting a new manifestation. How interesting is this? The birth of the earth. Well, when the dawn of the new creation, of the new Mahaman Vantara began, that is to say, of the new great cosmic day, in which we are currently, the causal logos were logos cause entered into activity, it started the electrical whirlwind, the electrical hurricane, and thereafter that electricity differentiated the primitive iliaster, and once differentiated, duality came then into play. Nonetheless, the iliaster itself is not dual, it is monistic, it includes purusha and prakriti, that is, spirit and substance, therefore, it is monistic. But the electricity of the causal logos, at the dawn of creation, differentiated that iliaster, and then idios arose, that is to say, chaos, the mysterium magnum, the magnus limbus, since there are two existential limbi, 
the magnus limbus of the macrocosm and the limbus of the microcosm. And just as from the magnus limbus the universe arises again, awakens to a new activity, likewise, from our microcosmic limbus the superior existential bodies of being can arise, if so desired. When the limbus magnus arose, as a result of the differentiation initiated by the logos cause, the solar logos, the fire, immediately became active, it had to be like this. By unfolding themselves, the Elohim became father-mother. In supreme creative union of him and her, of Osiris Isis, the third arose, the Kabir, the calf, the child, the fire that made that Magnus Limbus where the seed of this universe was fruitful. The Magnus Limbus is where the matter was potentially contained, that is the authentic original protile, that is the promatter, there it was in potentiality waiting, and the fire impregnated the limbus magnus, and then the lunar life came into activity again, that protile came into existence. The same elements, the fundamental basis of the existence of creatures, fire, air, water and earth, undoubtedly have their original protile, their iliaster. Whoever manages the iliaster of the elements, obviously becomes king or queen of the elements of nature and of the cosmos. Thus arose the elements, fire undoubtedly crystallized into air, air into water, and water into earth, and a new planet came into existence, a new solar system that emerged from the iliaster, a new earth, child of the moon, child of the lunar soul, child of the lunar spirit, the outcome of the original protile, or of the iliaster. That earth, in the beginning, was merely mental during the first round, astral during the second round, etheric during the third round, and now that we are in the fourth round, it is physical, in the fifth round it will be etheric again, in the sixth round it will be astral again, and in the seventh round, mental, and finally, life will return, once again, to its original protile, to its iliaster, to the germ from which it came, to its authentic seed. Just as in a grain, in a germ, for example, in the germ of a tree, the whole tree is potentially contained, so, in the germ of the universe, the entire universe is potentially contained. Behold how variety is unity. Realize for yourselves how wrong many pseudo-esotericists, pseudo-occultists and scientists are when they pretend that the moon is a piece of the earth shot into space. That concept is false. Today, the root shell that has remained, that corpse already lifeless, dead, revolves around its child the earth, and the earth continues to vampirize it, absorbing all its elements, although it no longer has anything to absorb from it, since the earth has already absorbed everything from it, vampirized it. So, it is not the moon that is vampirizing the earth, it is the earth that has vampirized the moon, the pseudo-esotericists and pseudo-occultists who claim that the moon is a piece of earth shot into space are wrong. You have to investigate directly. In the name of the truth I have to give testimony that as a bodhisattva I lived in the ancient earth moon and knew its seven great races and its powerful civilizations. A day will come when the shovel of the astronauts, archaeologists or geologists who go there, discover in the lunar subsoil vestiges of ancient cultures, and then they will realize that, really, the moon is older than the earth. The influence of the moon Today that cold corpse radiates death and desolation, unfortunately, there was a certain brother who had the habit of staring at the moon for hours, finally lost his eyes, he became blind forever. That brother already disincarnated. The moon has a great influence on the high and low tides, since it is the mother of the earth, on the sap of plants, on the cycles of diseases, etc. Nonetheless, the moon is very close friend to witches and black magicians. Let us remember the sorceresses of Thessaly, who knew in depth the secrets of the moon. Let us remember the black tantrics of Bengal, and also the trans Himalayas, who do not ignore the secrets of the moon. 
The adepts of the conscious circle of solar humanity, which operates on the higher centers of the being, keep much secret in relation to the eighth submerged sphere, which is lunar, read hell, the devil, and karma. When one studies the Aeneid by Virgil, the poet of Mantua, the master of the Florentine Dante Alighieri, one may well remember the Strophades Islands and that which called Selene of which the great initiate Virgil spoke. In the name of truth we say that the moon is dark, terribly mechanistic. Unfortunately we inherit that in the flesh, we inherit it in the blood, in the bones, in the psyche, in everything, because our very planet Earth, with all its creatures, is the child of the moon, the same world of Yesid, the Mercury or ethereal vital world, also contains, in itself, the moon, earth and moon, in Yesid, is like an egg with two yolks. The same crystallization of all seeds, both in humans and in plants, and in everything that is, has been and will be, is due to the lunar radiations. What is the mystery, for example, of a tree? Its seed, its germ. What is the mystery of a man? His germ, his seed, then in the germ is the mysterium magnum of a man. If we do not work with the mysterium magnum of the human germ, we would never achieve the intimate self-realization of the being, that's obvious. Unquestionably, this universe has arisen from its original protile. When Ares, the lamb, the sacred fire impregnated the great limbus, the magnus limbus, life arose. Only on the side of Ares, of the lamb, of fire, which can be written with those four letters, I and R I, is it possible for us to become independent from the lunar forces, otherwise, it is not possible. The Influence of the Sun The moon is terribly mechanistic. On some occasion I had told you that the sun has created this root race to carry out an experiment. Which? To create humans, solar humans, and the creations have been few. In the time of Abraham some human creations were made, at the time, during the first eight centuries of Christianity, there were some other human creations, in the Middle Ages a few, and now, at this moment, the sun is making supreme efforts to see if it achieves some more human creations. It is trying, before her colubus arrives, the planet that comes to produce the universal fire and the revolution of the axes of the earth, with the subsequent end of the great Aryan race. Well then, only on the side of fire, of the logos, on the side of Aries, could we become independent from lunar mechanics. All humanoids are 100% mechanistic, unconscious, they work with the consciousness asleep, they live asleep, they do not know where they come from or where they are going to, they are deeply hypnotized. Hypnosis is collective, massive, it flows in all nature, comes from the abominable Kundabuffer organ. This race is hypnotized, unconscious, submerged in the deepest sleep, and it is only possible to awaken by destroying the I, the ego, annihilating it, reducing it to dust. Our level of being today. We have to recognize, with complete clarity, that almost all humanoids are at a very low level of being. First of all, let's think a little bit, let's reflect on ourselves for a moment. We have emerged from a particular ray of creation, each one of us has his own particular ray of creation, and in that ray, to which we belong, there are different levels of being. Some are at levels too low, others at levels a little higher, because one is the level of the drunkard and another is the level of the esotericist or occultist, one is the level of the intellectual and the other is the level of the emotional subject. One is the level of the dignified, modest woman, and the other is the model of the unworthy, and modest woman, there are different levels of being. You, my dear brothers and sisters, already through these talks and these lectures, have received much esoteric illustration. We have indicated to you how to become independent from the lunar forces, which are mechanistic, and how to acquire solar intelligence. I have told you that through fire, we can free ourselves from the lunar mechanics. I have told you that by means of fire, 
we can become solar humans, but first of all I want us to be honest, every one of us, here tonight, have you already realized, perhaps, your own level of being, the level of being in which you are? Are you aware that you are hypnotized, that you are asleep? Have you already realized that you identify, not only with external things, with the external world, but that you also identify with yourself, with your lustful thoughts, with your drunkenness, with your anger, with your greed, with self-importance, with vanity, with prejudice, with mystical pride, with self-merit, etc.? Have you already realized that you have not only identified with the external, but with that which is vanity, that which is pride? For example, did you triumph today over today? Did you triumph over today? Or did today triumph over you? What did you do today, my dear brothers and sisters? What psychological defect did you eliminate? Are you sure that you have not identified yourself today with some morbid thought, or with some greedy thought, or with pride, or with the insulter, or with some concern, with some debt, etc., etc., etc.? Are you sure of that? Did you triumph over today or did today triumph over you? What did you do today? Have you already realized the level of being you are in? Did you go to a higher level of being or did you stay where you were? What did you do? What did you do today, my dear brothers and sisters? Did today triumph over you or did you triumph over today? Do you think, perhaps, that it is possible to pass to a higher level of being if we do not eliminate certain psychological defects? Or are you perhaps happy with that level of being in which you currently are? Do not forget, I repeat, that in that ray to which we belong, there are different levels of being, and if we are going to stay all our lives on one level of being, then what are we doing? For each level, at each level, there are certain bitternesses, certain sufferings, that is obvious. Everyone complains that they are suffering, everyone complains about problems, everyone complains about the state they are in, their struggles, but I ask myself one thing, do the brothers and sisters worry, perhaps, about going to a higher level of being? Obviously, while we are at the level of being in which we are, all the adverse circumstances that we already know will have to be repeated, all the bitterness in which we find ourselves, the same problems will have to arise over and over again. Many complain, they say, but hey, how do I get out of the state I am in? How will I go to a higher level of being? I explain that they have to eliminate certain defects, but they do not want to understand. Below us, each one of us, there are different levels of being. Above us, there are different rungs. At the level we are now, there are problems, the struggles, we already know them, the difficulties are the same, nothing changes. As long as we are at the level we are, again and again the same difficulties will arise. Do you want to change? Do you no longer want to have the problems that afflict you so much, the economic, the political, the social, the spiritual, the family, the business, the lust, the hate, the envy, etc.? Do you want to save yourself from so many difficulties? Well then, you only have to go to a higher level of being. Each time we take a step towards a higher level of being, we become a little more independent from the forces of the moon, which we carry, as I have already told you, in the flesh, in the blood, and in the bones, and in the, the spirit, and in the soul, and in everything, because we are children of the moon, unfortunately. Sometimes we have talked about the particular characteristic psychological feature of each person. Certainly, each person has a psychological characteristic feature, that's true. Some will have lust as their characteristic feature, others greed, others hatred, etc. Listen, the characteristic feature is a sum of several particular typical features. And I must tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, that for each particular characteristic feature, there is always a definite event, a definite circumstance. 
that a man is lustful. Then observe his life, and there will always be circumstances of lust in his life, accompanied by certain problems. That other is a drunkard. That is his characteristic feature, observe his life. That that one is greedy. Well, that is his characteristic feature, and around him there will be prisons, there will be financial problems, lawyers, lawsuits, etc. For each particular characteristic feature, there is always a circumstance, or a series of defined circumstances that repeat themselves always, always, always. So if we do not know our psychological characteristic feature, we are going poorly. We need to know it, if we want to go on to a higher level of being and eliminate from ourselves the undesirable elements that constitute that particular psychological characteristic feature. Otherwise, how would we move to a higher level of being? You want to stop suffering, but you are not trying to change, you are not fighting to go to a higher level of being, so how could you change? How to rise out of suffering? Now, there is a concrete fact in life, and it is the discontinuity of nature, that's obvious. All phenomena are discontinuous, i.e. in levels separated by intervals, gaps. Thus, the different levels of being are discontinuous. This means that through evolution, we can never reach perfection, the dogma of evolution is useless, except to stagnate ourselves. I know many pseudo-esotericists and pseudo-occultists, sincere people, with good hearts, bottled up in the dogma of evolution, who wait for time to perfect themselves, and thousands and millions of years pass and they are never perfected. Why? Because they do not change the level of being, they always remain on the same level. Then it is necessary to go beyond the dogma of evolution and to enter the revolutionary path, which is the path of the revolution of the consciousness. Evolution and its twin devolution are two laws that are processed simultaneously in everything created, they constitute the mechanical axis of nature, but they never lead us to liberation. They form the wheel of samsara. There is evolution in the grain that germinates, in the plant that grows, bears branches and fruits, and there is devolution in the tree that gradually withers, degenerates, goes into decrepitude and finally dies. There is evolution in the creature that is formed in the womb, in the young man who throws himself into the fight with life. There is devolution in the old man who enters the state of decrepitude and finally dies. The laws of devolution and evolution are purely material, physical, they have nothing to do with the intimate self-realization of the being. We do not deny them, they exist, but they do not serve for self-realization. We need to be truly revolutionaries to enter the path of the revolution of the consciousness. How could we pass to a higher level of being if we were not revolutionaries? Let's look at the different rungs of a ladder. They are discontinuous. Likewise are the different levels of being discontinuous. A certain number of activities belongs to each level of being. When one goes to a higher level of being, one has to take a leap and stop all the activities that one had on the lower level of being. I still remember those times in my life, some 30, 40 or 50 years ago, they were transcended. Why? Because I went to higher levels of being, and what then constituted the most important thing for me, my activities at that time, were suspended, cut off, because in the upper echelons there are other activities, which are completely different. Likewise you, if you go to a higher level of being, you have to leave many things that are currently important to you, and that belong to the level in which you are. So this includes a leap, and that leap is revolutionary, rebellious, it is never evolutionary, it is always revolutionary, rebellious, it is not evolutionary, it is not devolutionary either, it is revolutionary, rebellious. And so we, going up through the different levels of being, will reach the highest level of being, or the highest levels of being in God. God itself is intelligence, it is the intelligence of intelligence, 
It is not the spiritual light. It is the light of the spiritual light. It is the flame of the flame, the truth of the truth. To reach to that experience of the real of the real requires going to higher levels of being, and this is only possible through incessant revolutions, constant revolutions. When one studies the Gospels of Christ, one comes to realize, indeed, that the Lord of Perfection wants us to liberate ourselves. Let's look at the Beatitudes, for example, they are 100% solar, not lunar. The Beatitudes Begin by teaching us non-identification, blessed are. Says the Lord of Perfections, blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But well, who are the poor in spirit? Has it occurred to you to think about it? Is a man who is identified with money, with his lawsuits, with his business, etc., is he perhaps poor in spirit? Is a man who is identified with himself, who is full of images of himself where he feels great, powerful, sublime, ineffable, etc., is he perhaps poor in spirit? Obviously not. The one who is full of himself has not left a little place for God, then he is not poor in spirit. Then, how could he be blessed? Take pride, for example. The one who has money is not the only one who is proud. Pride is not only found in the one who belongs to a very show-off family, as they say. The proud are not only those who have a brand new car, who is happy with it. There is another pride. I want to refer clearly to mystical pride. Some schools of the pseudo-esoteric and pseudo-occult type say, through the law of evolution, one day we will become ineffable gods, man is called to become a god. Of course, such teachings lead one to mystical pride, spiritual conceit, mythomania, because a human, although he is very perfect, in reality, although he becomes a bodhisattva, he is nothing more than that, a human. God is the Father who is in secret, only he is God. The Father can take a human, if he is very perfect, if he is a bodhisattva, put it in his mind, or put it in his heart, or put it to work outside of himself, somewhere, so that this human does something, but for that human, that puppet to feel that he is God, is mythomania of the worst kind, of the worst taste. Humans are humans, and nothing more than that, humans. God is God. But we humans are humans. He who feels very wise because he has some knowledge of pseudo-esotericism or pseudo-occultism here, in the mind, and thinks that he is already a great initiate, etc., 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 he has fallen into mythomania, he is full of himself. Each one of us is nothing more than a vile worm in the mud of the earth. When I say this, I start with myself, but I consider myself that and nothing more than that, a vile worm in the mud of the world. God is God, but that is what he is, that is his business. We are not gods, we are simply vile worms in the mud of the earth, and believing ourselves to be gods is absurd, or believing ourselves wise. So, really, indeed, my dear friends, being full of yourself, having false images of yourself, fantasies of yourself, is not being poor in spirit. When one recognizes one's nothingness and inner misery, when one does not feel so sublime, nor so godly, nor so wise, when one understands that one is a sinner like any other, then one is no longer full of oneself, and one will be blessed. But what is this about being blessed? Many think that they will be blessed the day they die and go up there, to enjoy heavenly bliss with the little angels. No, that is a false concept. Blessed means happiness, they will be happy. Where? Here and now. Note, in the Latin, each of these blessings begins with the word beati, which translates to happy or blessed, plural adjective. They will enter the kingdom of heaven. Correct, may they enter the kingdom of heaven. But where is the kingdom of heaven? Where in the universe is it? Let us be honest with ourselves, 
The kingdom of heaven is formed by the conscious circle of solar humanity, which operates on the higher centers of the being, that is the kingdom of heaven. So let us be practical and understand all of this. This is how we must act. Thus, the gospel of the Lord begins by teaching us non-identification. You identify with yourself, thinking that you are going to have a lot of money, a nice late model car, or that your girlfriend loves it, or that you are going to get a great fortune, or that you are a great gentleman, or that you are a great sage. There are many ways to identify with yourself. One has to begin by not identifying with oneself, and then not identifying with things outside. When one does not identify, for example, with an insulter, one then forgives him, loves him, cannot hurt him, and if someone hurts one's self-esteem, but one does not identify with self-esteem, it is clear that one cannot feel any pain, since one is not hurt. And if one does not identify with one's vanity, one does not mind walking down the street even with patched pants. Why? Because one is not identified with vanity. Thus, first of all do not identify with yourself, and then not identify with the vanities of the outside world. When one does not identify with oneself, one can forgive. Let us remember the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our trespasses, just as we forgive those who trespass against us. I'll tell you something else. It is not enough to simply forgive, you have to cancel your debts, and that's it. Someone could forgive an enemy, but he would never cancel the debts. We must be honest, we need to cancel, and that is the meaning of the substance of that phrase that says, Forgive us our trespasses, just as we forgive those who trespass against us. As long as one identifies with himself, one cannot forgive anyone. It hurts to be insulted, it hurts to be humiliated, it hurts to be belittled. Why? Because one has the eye of pride, one has the eye of self-esteem, there inside, very well alive, and as long as one has the eye of self-esteem, it hurts that another comes and hurts his self-esteem. Thus, if we do not identify with ourselves, then it is easy for us to forgive, and even more, I say, cancel debts, that is better. The Gospel of the Lord also says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This is another blessing that no one has understood. Blessed are, let us say, the non-resentful, because if one is resentful, how can one be meek? The resentful person spends his time doing the math, ah, but I did so many and so many favors for this individual, that I, and I, and I, and I, and I protected him, that I did so many works of charity, and see how he has paid me. Ah, this friend who I served him so much, and now he is not capable of serving me. Here, then, are the accounts of the resentful one. The Gospel of the Lord, when it says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, should be translated, Blessed are the non-resentful. How could one be meek, if one is full of resentments? The one who is full of resentments, lives doing math at all hours, therefore he is not meek. So how could he be blessed? What is meant by bliss? It is understood as happiness. Are you sure that you are happy? Who is happy? I have known people who say, I am happy, I am happy with my life, I am happy. But to those same people, we have heard them say, such and such fellow annoys me, I do not like that guy, I do not know why this that I have wanted so much is not done to me. So, they are not happy, really what happens is that they are hypocrites, that's all. Being happy is very difficult, it is necessary, first of all, to be meek. The word blessed means intimate happiness, not in a thousand years, but now, right here, in THS instant in which we are living. If we truly become meek, through non-identification, then we will become happy. But it is necessary not only not to identify with our thoughts of lust, hatred, revenge, rancor or resentment, no, we must eliminate from ourselves the red demons of Seth, 
those psychic aggregates that personify our psychological defects. We have to understand, for example, what the process of resentment is, we have to dissect resentment. When one comes to the conclusion that resentment is due to the fact that we have self-esteem within us, then we struggle to eliminate the ego of self-love, the I of self-love. But you have to comprehend it in order to eliminate it. We could not eliminate it if we have not previously comprehended it. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, in order to eliminate, it is necessary to appeal to Devi Kundalini Shakti, only she can disintegrate any psychological defect, including the eye of self-love. Are you sure that you are not resentful towards someone? Who among you is sure not to be resentful? Who among you is sure you are not doing the math? Who? All of this which I say unto you is lunar, see how we carry the moon down to the marrow of our bones. And if we want to become independent from the lunar mechanics, we have to eliminate from ourselves the eye of resentment, the eye of self-love, because it is written, Blessed are the meek, that is, the unresentful, for they will inherit the earth. This must be understood, my dear brothers and sisters, understand it with meridian clarity. When one understands this, one advances on the path that leads to final liberation. Only through the solar fire, through the fire of Aries, of the Lamb, of the incarnate Ram, of the intimate Christ, can we, in truth, burn all those inhuman elements that we carry within us, and as the consciousness is disembottled or unbottling, we are awakening. But the consciousness cannot awaken as long as it continues to be bottled up within the psychic aggregates that together constitute the myself, the I, the ego. We need to go through the Buddhist annihilation, here and now, we need to die from moment to moment, only with death does the new come, if the germ does not die, the plant is not born. We need to learn to live, thus freeing ourselves from that lunar heritage that we have. We truly bring such an inheritance, my dear brothers and sisters, from the very protile from which the universe arose. The moon has therefore been our mother, we are lunar, we are selenites, even though we live on earth. Now we need to become solar, march towards solar life, receive solar initiation. If we proceed like this, we will truly achieve authentic happiness and liberation, otherwise, it will not be possible, it will not be possible. We need to become true solar humans, in the most complete sense of the word, and this would not be possible if we do not eliminate from our psychological nature what is lunar about us. If we succeed, the fire will liberate us, transform us, make us different creatures. Questions and Answers Well, up to hear my words, now I give an opportunity to ask questions. Everyone can ask what they need to ask in relation to the topic, not to get off the subject when asking the question. I have to tell you in the name of the truth that we are in the third chamber, and those who come here have to come prepared, or not to come, stay in the second chamber until they are ready. Here we do not have, in that sense, considerations of any kind. The questions must be at the level of the third chamber. Let's see. Ask what you need to ask. Student, master, does the psychological feature have an intimate relationship with the level of being? Samuel Aun Weir. That is unquestionable, and each one has his own characteristic psychological feature, which is a sum of small characteristic features, too, moreover, I say, to the psychological feature that each one of us has, certain circumstances correspond to it, and as long as one does not eliminate from himself that original characteristic psychological feature, represented by multiple eyes or psychic aggregates, one will always go through the same circumstances, one and again, because the same. Circumstances always correspond to each level of being, they are repeated over and over again. On the other hand, if one goes one step higher, to another level of being, the circumstances change immediately, totally. But, to pass one step to another in the level of being, we need, first of all, 
to know the characteristic psychological feature that we have, which is nothing but a sum of different original characteristic aggregates. Let's see, brother. Student, venerable master, in past lectures, you spoke unto us about the law of reabsorption. Being the moon, as you explain, a corpse, will it not be reabsorbed into the bosom of the uncreated, will it always remain on the property? Samalon Weir, you are speaking from the point of view of a single key to the investigation of nature. The materialists, the henchmen of Marxism or materialism have actually only one key for the investigation of the mysteries of nature, and that key is called matter. They do not know it, but they call it matter, although they do not know it. We, the Gnostics, have seven keys for the study of the mysteries of nature. I already said, and I repeat, that the elements of the ancient earth-moon returned, I repeat, to their iliaster, obviously, when the fundamental elements, which are fire, air, water, and earth, returned to their iliaster, the moon was turned into a corpse, because creatures could not exist without the elements, the plant could not exist, neither the animal nor the human, without the elements fire, air, water, and earth. Let's think that the human body has the four elements inside, fire, represented in the red blood cells of it, the water in the lymph, in the sacred sperm, air in its lungs and earth in its bones. Now, let's take away the elements, the four elements from the earth. Could organic life exist on the face of the earth if the four elements were taken away from it? And where did the elements return, the four elements of the ancient earth moon? Did not they return into its iliaster? They remained into its iliaster, that's obvious. So what we see today, that crust that revolves around the earth, favorable, very favorable yes for the sorceresses of Thessaly and for the tantrics of Bengal and the Himalayas and Trans-Himalayas, it is not more than a corpse that revolves incessantly around the earth, but it is nothing more than that, a corpse. Scientists who assume that it is a piece of earth shot into space, a terrestrial splash, are completely wrong. Why don't Venus and Mercury have moons? What happens? And, why our earth has this moon and another that is far beyond? And why does planet Jupiter have moons and Saturn too? Could scientists give us an explanation? Or is it that perhaps on Jupiter there were also explosions to form moons, the same as on Saturn? Perhaps Condor also collided with Jupiter, or Neptune, or Mars. What do they know about that? Nothing, 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 nothing. They do not have but one key to the investigation of the mysteries of nature. We have seven keys, thus all lunar life returned, I repeat, to its iliaster. There it was deposited among the iliaster, which later differed with the electric power, in order to give rise to chaos, or idios, or simply the mysterium magnum or limbus magnum, from which the universe later emerged, thanks to the intervention of fire, this is something else. So all these elements that we have today are from the moon, including the earth element that was left in its iliaster. But the corpse that revolves around the earth, so sinister and so friendly to sorcerers and black wizards, obviously, is called to disappear, and it will disappear before the end of this Mahamanvantara, it will disintegrate in space. Any other question? Student, master, what is the reason for the brightness that the moon produces? What element is it due to the fact that it produces such light? Samalon Weir, this is a phenomenon known to anyone who knows a mirror. You yourself can take a mirror and reflect the sunlight and project it on whatever you want. It is a mirror, simply, that reflects the sunlight and projects it on the earth. Any other question? Speak, brother. Student, will the moon planet undergo modifications with the coming of her colubus, master? Samalon Weir, well, as far as we know, it may be a little further from the earth orbit, but it will definitely be shining at some distance from the earth until the end of the Mahamanvantara. Let's see. Everyone has the right to ask. Here is freedom of speech. Let's see, Brother Aladdin. 
Student, venerable master, we recognize the lunar influences. And all that, but why do the Mayan cultures, for example, the lunar temple of Chichen Itza have the symbol, then, of the aka Bolzub, the Divine Mother, and give origin to the cult, to the lunar centers, and because here in Teotihuacan, in the Pyramid of the Moon, their rituals were made to the woman who disincarnated or that were imitated, that is, they related it directly to the woman, to the Isis, to Moon? That is my question, Master. Samuel and Weir, well, let us also observe the cemeteries, where rotting rains, where the vegetation is richer, where death is, their life rains abundantly, that's obvious. The positive aspect of the moon or the radiant part of what the moon is, not the cadaverous aspect, but the spirit aspect, referring, then, properly to the iliaster, referring to the mysterium magnum, which is in the living humans, in their sexual glands and from which the royal adept can arise, referring to that limbus magnum from which the solar system arose, which is lunar in type, where a deity property is contained, that is, the spirit and the primordial substance, therefore, it deserves to be worshipped. That is the positive aspect, that of the Purusha property dash, or that of, simply, the Mahat intelligence that passed from the ancient moon to the earth. Because it is obvious that in that great limbus magnum from which this earth in which we live arose, there was Mahat, the universal intelligence that is still here, and that is one with property, that is, with life, with nature. Looking at things from that point, there are lunar cults, that's obvious, but another thing is the corpse that is rotating around the earth, friend of the sorceresses of Thessaly and the tantrics of Bengal, who infects with its decomposing germs everything that is, has been and will be. So, it is worth knowing that the moon of the moon is worshipped, but the geological crust that revolves around the earth is not worshipped, because our Mayan ancestors were not idolaters, understood? Well, just looking from that point would remain as a symbol nothing more. What other question is there? Well, I see silence from everyone, and then let's start our Gnostic unction. Inverential peace. Share this page. Skip to main content. Glory and average.